Hi there. Recently I picked up this PowerBook 150 for the princely sum of $15. So today we're going to see does it even work and just what is going on with the side here. All this plastic is exploded. Maybe we can fix that too. You've found your way to the basement. Now before we start pulling the 150 apart, let me talk a bit about why it exists. Hang on a minute, this is the 170 from three years earlier with the exact same case. That's right, the 150 is still rocking a case that was introduced in 91 and uh, it's three years on. So it's certainly at the budget end of Apple's laptops. But I don't think we should hold the case design against the 150. After all, Apple needed a budget laptop for that end of the market. They had the top end covered, they had the $4,800 uh, 540C with its fancy touchpad stereo speakers, built-in Ethernet. I mean, this thing was incredible. They had it uh, in the portable side. They had the 280C. These both sport the same 68040 processor, a powerhouse in its day. This thing was small and, and light and portable, and that came in at uh, $3,700. So they had this uh, incredible range of powerful, expensive laptops. Uh, so they brought out the 150 down at the cheaper end and this retailed for $1450 or $1600 if you spec'd up the RAM and hard drive. Which actually was quite good value because the same money bought you a Windows 3.1 Toshiba with only 4 megabytes of RAM and only a 200 megabyte hard drive. So this little machine, even though it wasn't as fancy as some of Apple's higher end offerings, it certainly was competitive in that lower end market. Now the reason the poor old 150 is looked down on by a lot of laptop nerds is because of what's going on on the back panel. And as you'll notice, there's a whole lot of nothing going on back here. We've got our power in here, we've got a single SCSI connector, and we have a printer connector and the power button. And that's it. Not even an ADB port, which every other Apple computer had at this point, to be able to connect an external keyboard or mouse. So you are stuck with what's built into the machine. And if that ever failed or you wanted to use it on desktop, well, you're out of luck. Now thankfully because of Apple's excellent Apple Talk networking protocol, you can use the printer port to connect this to other machines and network it. But of course you're not going to be getting any kind of Ethernet speeds, it's a really slow networking capability. But still, it's built into the machine so that's a bonus. Now it's not all compromised when it comes to the 150, in fact this machine could handle up to 40 megabytes of memory which is more than any other 100 series laptop. Plus, this machine sports a IDE hard drive, which although slightly slower than a SCSI hard drive and other Apple products, it actually is a bit cheaper and it means that in today's day and age we can easily upgrade it or put in a replacement SSD or similar into this machine. But what we're going to do now is connect some power, see if it turns on because that'll be a good start and if it does turn on we might continue to pull this thing apart and see if we can fix that damaged plastic as well. So I've got some power, let me just connect it. So now is probably a good time to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. So PCBWay is a great place to get all your PCBs made. And they also offer CNC machining and 3D printing. So it's really a one-stop shop. If you want to design and build anything electronic, you just check out PCBWay and they will make it work for you. So big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring the video today. And we get a boot chime straight away, which is a great sign. And the screen has come on, so we've got backlight. And it's giving us the flashing disk icon, meaning it can't find a boot disk. But that's great news. It likely means that this machine is working fine. It just needs a new hard drive. And of course, being IDE, we should be able to find a suitable replacement easily. Well then, I think it's time we start pulling this apart and seeing if we can fix all that broken plastic. Okay, so we're going to start by removing the screws that I can see here. There's a torque screw here, which probably a T8. Most stuff of this era, Apple stuff is Torx T8. And we have a few on the bottom. So uh, I don't think I need to remove this one. It's already removed itself. 
So we can see here that that plastic surround is just completely broken off. We might have to glue a washer or something onto here just so that that screw pulls down on this bezel. So we can see that this hinge is totally pulled away from the back of the monitor. The standoffs are still on the screws, so that'll be good. We can glue them back in and build up around them for strength. So let's carry on. Got the back plane off here and we can see that, yes, uh, that's looking particularly nasty. We can see whether they've broken off. And also what I wanna do is build up the plastic around these ones here as well, because I can start to see cracking forming um, in the, the plastic around those standoffs. What I'm gonna do first though, before I fix those hinge standoffs, is to continue disassembling the machine because likely there's other broken plastic inside here and we'll fix it all at the same time. So let me do that and I'll come back when it's all apart and ready to continue. So I've got the machine split apart and it's all good news actually in here. All of these standoffs, all the plastics look really, really good. I don't actually think I need to fix any of these or re-glue them, so I'm gonna leave them as they are. Now another thing I noticed, which is quite interesting, it has the original hard drive in it, and when we turned it on, it just gave us the flashing disk icon to say there was no boot disk, and that might be because it wasn't plugged in. So I'm gonna plug that in and we'll turn it on and see if this works. That'd be great if it does, because if it works, I'm just not even gonna to bother to replace it. We'll just leave it as it is. Now the PowerBook 150, the motherboard is actually based off the motherboard from a PowerBook 230. So it sports this kind of weird RAM expansion, this kind of funny card here, and the cards are actually swappable between the two models. I don't have one on hand, so we're gonna to have to make do with the four megabytes that are built in to this machine. I've cobbled it back together enough to test that hard drive, so I'll connect the power and see if it boots off it. There's our chime. Let me just adjust, there we go. Welcome to Macintosh. So it's booting off the hard drive, no problem. Okay, so it's booted into the desktop. Let's just have a look and see what we're running. So it's running 7.1.1, and that's probably what I'll leave it on for this machine. So that's one problem fixed. The hard drive works, and it's booting from that. So now let's tackle that broken plastic. So I use a construction grade epoxy adhesive. This is actually designed to attach bolts into concrete uh, for pretty high strength applications. So it's more than enough for this sort of application. I like using this because, um, first of all, it's gray. It's a similar color to the case, and it has kind of like um, reinforcing in it. So it ends up with a really strong product. So we've got to work pretty quickly. Uh, once it's mixed, it goes, to, it goes off pretty quick. I'm not gonna show too much of this on the video, but if fixing old broken plastics on PowerBooks is your particular kind of jam, then check out my PowerBook 170 repair, where I do plenty of it. Okay, our epoxy is rock hard. I've screwed these hinges back on and I've also uh, epoxied this washer in place of where the plastic had broken out. So it's similar to the other side now. So let's put it back together and see if it opens and closes properly. So everything's back together. This was the problem area before this hinge and now everything works perfectly. So the epoxy really did the trick. Now let's talk a bit about the software. So just before I forget, I do have the last piece of the puzzle for our cosmetic upgrade here. This is a battery cover that I've pulled off a dead battery. So we're just gonna clip that on the side here, cover up that hole, and our Mac is finished. The 150 is ready for its software. Now, speaking of software, the 150 is a little different to all the other Macs. Remember, they all had SCSI hard drives. This is the only Mac around at this time with an IDE hard drive. So it needed some special files to make work with the OS. And thankfully, they came on a utilities disc which came with the 150s when you bought them. Now, I didn't have one, but I managed to find this online and I'll put a link in the description down below if you find yourself in the same situation and you're trying to get an OS onto your PowerBook 150. Now, just a caveat, the instructions on that website aren't correct anymore. Modern Macs won't actually write a floppy that 
older Macs will read or vice versa. So it's, it gets a little awkward. I managed to do it by downloading the raw image file and burning it to the floppy using Berliner Etcher to a USB floppy drive connected to my iMac. And that worked quite well and produced a working disc. So the reason why we actually need to muck around with the operating system on here is because the operating system that was on that original hard drive had something funky going on. It seemed to be missing files and it had been sort of mucked around with a bit and it wasn't working very well. So what we're going to do is install a new operating system on here with the help of our utilities disk, which we can boot off and we can also use this here, which is a blue SCSI. Now, in case you're unfamiliar with what this is, a blue SCSI is a, uh, it's a hard drive emulator which plugs into any Mac's SCSI port. And even though this has an IDE hard drive inside, it still has that SCSI port on the back so we can connect this to this machine. And handily on the SD card in here, I have got Apple's recovery CD as a hard disk image. And that contains all of the OS versions that we're likely to ever need for these old classic Macs. So my plan is we can boot off the utilities disk and then we can install the system we want from the blue SCSI which is plugged in the back. Let's try it out. So let's plug in our blue SCSI. We need of course the blue SCSI itself and this adapter because the uh, I think that's a 25 pin SCSI port needs to be converted to this weird square one that Apple used. So let's connect these two. And then the last thing we need to do is connect some power. And we've got some LED there. If it's not flashing, that means it's good. So let's plug it into the back of the machine. Okay, let me connect the power and pop that in. Okay, it's booted to desktop and you can see that we've got our utilities disk, that's what we've booted from. And you can see also that we have the legacy recovery, which is the SCSI drive we've plugged in the back. And down here, we can see that the IDE hard drive is being recognized. But what we're going to do first up is we're gonna initialize that hard drive and make sure it's ready for our fresh install. So on the utilities disk, we have internal HD format. And this is what you need for an IDE drive. And we can see that it's found the hard drive. So let's call it PowerBook 150 HD and then hit initialize. It's gonna erase all data. Yes, that's okay, because we wanna start from a blank slate. Completed successfully, good news. So let's go to Legacy Recovery. And we can see that it's pretty much got every old Apple device on here. Uh, we wanna install Mac OS, so it's, let's go in that folder. And we can choose to install by CPU, which is what we want, because we can just simply go to PowerBook 150 and it gives us all the options. I think I'm gonna go with 7.1, given that that's the original that this machine came with, and it should be slightly faster than 7.5 and run a bit leaner. Let's just double click on that. And then it's simply a matter of double clicking net install, and it's going to mount the images it needs and then start installing from them. And there we go, once it's mounted the images, it automatically runs the installer, and we can just click OK and continue through. So that's all worked fine. I tell you, the Blue SCSI has made this sort of thing so much easier than it used to be in the past. Now the next thing we want to do is get some games on this machine, and given its limited I.O. options, I have a cunning plan. That's right, it's the 540C that we saw at the beginning of the video, and we're going to need its help today to get this thing on the network. So even though the 150 is really limited with its I.O., only having that SCSI port and that serial connection, they're actually the two most useful things that we need in this context. We've already used the SCSI port to get the OS installed, and now we're gonna use the serial port to connect this to a modern network. Essentially, the 150 is connected via serial connection to the 540, and the 540 is connected to my home network via Ethernet, which wirelessly connects to a router in the office, which is also connected to my server, which is a titanium PowerBook running Mac OS 10.2. 
Now in order to make this happen, all this machine needs is a bit of software called Local Talk Bridge, and it just seamlessly passes through the Ethernet through to the serial cable and Apple Talk all the way through, and it just works. And we'll prove that by going up to our chooser, and if we click on Apple Share, you'll see here we've got RetroNet, and that is the server I've got running upstairs on the Titanium PowerBook. So let's connect to that. Here's our server. So we don't want to worry about any of this boring stuff. Let's check out the games. So you can run these straight from the server, but there is performance issues. So we're going to copy them over to the hard drive. So we'll get Load Runner, we'll get Lemmings, and we'll just start with those two. And let's just drag them over. And we're good to go. Let's play a bit of Load Runner. So you can tell the screen being passive, it's not super good for movement, although uh, this is better than some other screens, notably the, uh, the Toshiba which I've repaired recently had a much worse screen than this. So this is at least somewhat playable. Yeah, well I better not play this forever, we've got a video to finish. Let's just try Lemmings. Let's go. Gee, it's been a while since I played this. So, one problem, you can't see the mouse once it goes over this background here. Can't see what I'm picking. So we need the climber guy, I think. Or the builder. Which one's the builder? Sorry buddy, you're gonna die in the hole. Great music, but yeah, these kind of games that really show up the limitation of this older screen technology. I don't think that really helps much, mucking around with the contrast. So, not the ideal way to play Lemmings. So there we have it, the little 150 is all put back together, everything's working great. Now it's never going to be a very good games machine I know because of that limited screen. But a lot of people look down on the PowerBook 150 and they criticise it because of its I.O. And sure enough, yeah, not being able to hook up an external mouse or keyboard is quite limiting. But we've shown today that we can work with the ports that it does have, the SCSI port and the serial port to do everything that we need to do on this machine. You've been in the basement, have a great day.